<laughs> hey, sweet squirrels. Got one of these little candies in my mouth. I don't know why I always do that. I sit down here and I see them and I just have to pop one in my mouth and then I'm... I know I'm going to be talking or reading. Whatever. I'll stick it over here. Alright, we're mid-chapter. But before he could execute his design, the roll of a carriage was heard in the avenue. And pausing an instant, Uh, with head erect like a startled doe, Sylvia turned and vanished, dropping flowers as she ran. Mr. Yule, accompanied by son and daughter, came hurrying in with greetings, explanations, and apologies, and in a moment the house was full of a pleasant stir. Steps went up and down, voices echoed through the room, savory odors burst forth from below, and doors swung in the wind as if the spell was broken and the sleeping palace had wakened with a word. Prue made a hasty toilet and harassed the cook to the verge of spontaneous combustion, while Mark and his father devoted themselves to their guest. Just as dinner was announced, Sylvia came in as calm and cool as if wheelbarrows were myths and linen suits unknown. Moore was welcomed with a quiet handshake, a grave salutation and a look that seemed to say, Wait a little, I take no friends on trust. All through dinner, though she sat as silent as a well-bred child, she looked and listened with an expression of keen intelligence that children do not wear and sometimes smiled to herself, as if she saw or heard something that pleased and interested her. When they rose from table, she followed Prue upstairs, quite forgetting the disarray in which the drawing room was left. The gentleman took possession before either sister returned, and Mark's annoyance found vent in a phil philippic. In a philippic? Against oddities in general, and Sylvia in particular. But his father and friends sat in the cushionless chairs and pronounced the scene amusingly novel. Prue appeared in the midst of the laugh, and having discovered other delinquencies above, her patience was exhausted and her regrets found no check in the presence of a, of a so old a friend as more. Something must be done about that child, Father, for she's getting, getting entirely beyond my control. If I attempt to make her study, she writes poetry instead of her exercises, draws caricatures instead of sketching properly, and bewilders her music teacher by asking questions about Beethoven and Mendelssohn as if they were personal friends of his. If I beg her to take exercise, she rides like an Amazon all over the island, grubs in the garden as if for her living or goes paddling about the bay till I'm distracted lest the tide should carry her out to sea. She is so wanting in moderation she gets ill, and when I give her proper medicine, she flings them out the window and threatens to send that worthy Dr. Baum after them. <laughs> Yet she must need something to set her right, for she is either overflowing with unnatural spirits or melancholy enough to break one's heart. What have you done with the little black sheep of my flock? Not banished her, I hope, said Mr. Yule, placidly ignoring all complaints. She's in the garden, attending to some of her disagreeable pets, I fancy. If you're going out there to smoke, please send her in, Mark. I want her. As Mr. Yule was evidently yearning for his after-dinner nap and Mark for his cigar, Moore followed his friend and they stepped through the window into the garden, now lovely with the fading glow of summer sunset. You must know that this peculiar little sister of mine clings to some of her childish beliefs and pleasures in spite of Prue's preaching and my raillery, began Mark, after a fresh, refreshing whiff or two. She's overflowing with love and goodwill, but being too shy or too proud to offer it to her, her fellow creatures, she expends it upon the necessitous inhabitants of earth, air, and water with the most charming philanthropy. 
Her dependents are neither beautiful nor very interesting, nor is she sentimentally enamored of them, but the more ugly and desolate the creature, the more devoted is she. Look at her now. Most young ladies would have hysterics over one of those pets of hers. <laughs> Moore looked and thought the group a very pretty one, though a plump toad sat at Sylvia's feet, a roly-poly caterpillar was walking up her sleeve, a blind bird chirped on her shoulder, bees buzzed harmlessly about her head as if they mistook her for a flower, and in her hand a little field mouse was breathing its short life away. Any tender-hearted girl might have, might have stood thus, surrounded by helpless things that pity had endeared, but few would have regarded them with an expression like that which Sylvia wore. Figure, posture, and employment were so childlike in their innocent unconsciousness that the contrast was all the more strongly marked between them and the sweet thoughtfulness that made her face singularly attractive with the charm of dawning womanhood. Moore spoke before Mark could dispose of his smoke. This is a great development upon the boudoir full of lap dogs worsted work in novels, Miss Sylvia. May I ask if you feel no repugnance to some of your patients? Or is your charity strong enough to beautify them all? I dislike many people, but few animals, because, however ugly, I pity them. And whatever I pity, I am sure to love. It may be silly, but I think it does me good. Until I am wise enough to help my fellow beings, I try to do my duty to these humbler sufferers and find them both grateful and affectionate. There was something very winning in the girl's manner as she spoke, touching the little creature in her hand almost as tenderly as if it had been a child. It showed the newcomer another phase of this many-sided character. And while Sylvia related the histories of her pets at his request, he was enjoying that finer his history, which every ingenious soul writes on its owner's countenance for gifted eyes to read and love. As she paused, the little... The little mouse lay stark and still in her gentle hand, and though they smiled at themselves, both young men felt like boys again as they helped her scoop a grave among the pansies, owning the beauty of compassion, though she showed it to them in such a simple shape. Then Mark delivered his message, and Sylvia went away to receive Prue's lecture without meekness but such an absent mind that the words of wisdom went by her like the wind. Now come and take our twilight stroll while Mark keeps Mr. Moore in the studio and Prue prepares another exor exhortation. <clears throat> no, exhortation, said Sylvia as her father woke and taking his arm they paced along the wide piazza that encircled the whole house. Will father do me a little favor? That is all he lives for, dear. Then his life is a very successful one, and the girl folded her other hand over that already on his arm. Mr. Yule shook his head with a regretful sigh, but asked benignly, What shall I do for my little daughter? Forbid Mark to execute a plot with which he threatens me. He says he will bring every gentleman he knows, and that's a great many, to the house and make it so agreeable that they will keep coming, for he insists that I need amusement, and nothing will be so entertaining as a lover or two. And please tell him not to, for I don't want any lovers yet. Why not? asked her father, much amused at her twilight confidences. I'm afraid. Love is so cruel to some people, I feel as if it would be to me. For I am always in extremes and continually going wrong while trying to go right. Love bewilders the wisest and it would make me quite and it would make me quite blind or mad, I know. Therefore I'd rather have nothing to do with it for a long, long while. Then Mark shall be forbidden to bring a single specimen. I very much prefer to keep you as you are. And yet, you may be happier to do as others do. Try it, if you like, my dear. But I can't do it as others do. I've tried and failed. Last winter, when Prue made me go about, 
though people probably thought me a stupid little thing moping in corners. I was enjoying myself in my own way and making discoveries that have been very useful ever since. I know I'm whimsical and hard to please, and I have no doubt the fault was in myself, but I was disappointed in nearly everyone I met, though I went into what Prue calls our best society. The girls seemed all made on the same pattern. They all said, did, thought, and wore about the same things, and knowing one was as good as knowing a dozen. Jessie Hope was the only one I cared much for, and she is so pretty she seems made to be looked at and loved. How did you find the young gentleman, Sylvia? Still worse, for though lively enough among themselves, they never found it worth their while to offer us any conversation. But such as was very like the champagne and ice cream they brought us, sparkling, sweet, and unsubstantial. Almost all of them wore the superior air they put on before women, an air that says as plainly as words, I may ask you and I may not. Now that is very exasperating to those who care no more for them than so many grasshoppers. And I often long to take the conceit out of them by telling some of the critis criticisms by telling some of the criticisms passed upon them by the amiable young ladies who looked as if waiting to say meekly, Yes, thank you. Don't excite yourself, my dear. It's all very lamentable and laughable, but we must submit till the world learns better. They're often excellent young persons among the grasshoppers. <clears throat> and if you cared to look, you might find a pleasant friend here or there, said Mr. Yule, leaning a little toward his son's view of the matter. No, I cannot even do that without being laughed at, for sooner or later do I mention the word friendship than people nod wisely and look as if they said, oh yes, everyone knows what that sort of thing amounts to. I should like a friend, Father, someone beyond home, because he would be newer, a man, young or old, I don't care which, because men go where they like, see things with their own eyes, and have more to tell if they choose. I want a person simple, wise, and entertaining, and I think I should make a very grateful friend, if such a one was kind enough to like me. I think you would, and perhaps if you try to be more like others, you will find friends as they do, and so be happy, Sylvia. I cannot be like others, and their friendships would not satisfy me. I don't try to be odd. I long to be quiet and satisfied, but I cannot. And when I do what Prue calls wild things, it is not because I'm thoughtless or idle, but because I'm trying to be good and happy. The old ways fail, so I attempt new ones, hoping they will succeed, but they don't. And still I go looking and longing for happiness, yet always failing to find it, till sometimes I think I am a born disappointment. Perhaps love would bring the happiness, my dear. I'm afraid not, but however that may be, I shall never go running about for a lover as half my mates do. When the true one comes, I shall know him, love him at once, and cling to him forever, no matter what may happen. Till then, I want a friend, and I will find one if I can. Don't you believe there may be a real and simple friend? Don't you believe there may be real and simple friendships between men and women without falling into this everlasting sea of love? Mr. Yule was laughing quietly under cover of the darkness, but con composed himself enough to answer gravely. Yes, for some of the most beautiful and famous friendships have been such, and I see no reason why there may not be again. Look about, Sylvia. Make yourself happy, and whether you find friend or lover, remember there's always the old papa glad to do his best for you in both capacities. Sylvia's hand crept to her father's shoulder, and her voice was full of daughterly affection, as she said. I'll have no lover but the old papa for a long while yet, but I'll look about, and if I'm fortunate enough to find...
<clears throat> and good enough to keep the person I want, I shall be very happy. For Father, I really think I need a friend. Here Mark called his sister in to sing to them for a demand that would have been refused, but for a promise to prove to behave her best as an atonement for past pranks. Stepping in, she sat down and gave Moore another surprise as from her slender throat came a voice whose power and pathos made a tragedy of the simple ballad she was singing. Why did you choose that plain of thing, all about love, despair, and death? It quite breaks one's heart to hear it, said Prue's. Prue, pausing in a mental estimate of her morning's shopping. It came into my head, and so I sung it. Now I'll try another, for I'm bound to please you if I can. And she broke about again with an airy melody as jubilant as if a lark had mistaken moonlight for the dawn and soared skyward, singing as it went. So blithe and beautiful were both voice and song they caused a sigh of pleasure, a sensation of keen delight in the listener, and seemed to gift the singer with an unsurprised charm. As she ended, Sylvia turned about and seen the satisfaction of their guest in his face prevented him from expressing it in words by saying in her frank in her frank way never mind the compliments i know my voice is good for that you may think thank nature that it is well trained for that praise hair petal sturm and that you have heard it all you owe to my desire to atone for certain trespasses of yesterday and today, because I seldom sing before strangers. Allow me to offer my hearty thanks to nature, petal sturm, and penitence, and also to hope that in time I may, I may be regarded not as a stranger, but, uh, but a neighbor and a friend. Something in the gentle emphasis of the last word struck pleasantly on the girl's ear and seemed to answer an unspoken longing. She looked up at him with a searching glance, uh, appeared to find some assurance given by looks, and as a smile broke over her face, she offered her hand as if obeying a sudden impulse and said half to him, half to herself, I think I found the friend already. And that's it. For chapter 2. And we'll stop there today. Tomorrow. Chapter 3 is called. Afloat. I hope y'all are having a happy crafty day. <laughs> I'm having my usual. Do a couple stitches and go. <laughs> Ain't worth two cents. Love you all. Mwah. Be sweet. Don't be ugly. Bye-bye.